Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar with Bruce Edwards of Edwards Mediation Academy. I'll start with a short introduction here and give everyone a minute to join us. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kristen Maniscalco. I assist with marketing efforts for Edwards Mediation Academy, and I will be helping out with today's webinar. This morning, Bruce will be discussing mediation briefs from a mediator's perspective and how to write an effective and persuasive mediation brief. We will be recording this webinar, which we'll upload to our website within the next few days, and we'll send an email out to all attendees to let you know once that recording is available. Um, as always, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to send those. The easiest way is through the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we will do our best to address as many questions as possible within the hour. So good morning again to everyone who just joined, and good morning to you, Bruce. If you're ready, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Kirsten. Appreciate the introduction. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity today to talk on a topic of writing an effective mediation brief, particularly how it's viewed from a mediator's perspective, a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention uh, in our world uh, historically. Let me start with an acknowledgement. One, I, I think this is a topic that probably at first blush does not appear to be particularly exciting for many, uh, unlike uh, developments in neurobiology or, or <clears throat> impasse breaking techniques or mediation advocacy generally. It's a topic that just, I think, at the first uh, instance, maybe draws a bit more of a yawn. But I think it's because of that, in part, that we sort of <clears throat> uh, overlook the opportunity that writing an effective mediation brief presents and therefore the importance of attending to the detail uh, of that brief writing. Look, I've said in prior um, conversations with many of you that uh, I, I've had the privilege of teaching with a psychotherapist for years in Europe. Uh, he reminds me that uh, life is focused attention. And so too, uh, attention to detail in all aspects of our life uh, is critical, particularly in mediation. And it's what distinguishes those of us who want to excel uh, in the world of mediation advocacy or mediation generally from those who wish to just kind of remain in the pack. So uh, uh, how many of you have heard the stories of those sushi chefs in Japan who go through a multi-year program to become the best chefs possible. And you perhaps have heard that the first couple years of their curriculum are devoted exclusively to trying to develop the perfect rice. Imagine spending two years in a training program as a chef doing nothing but learning how to cook perfect rice. <clears throat> um, uh, how many of you have seen the YouTube video of the uh, retired uh, Navy SEAL, uh, Admiral McFadden, talk about the importance of each day making your bed in a certain way and attending to the detail. <clears throat> because again, uh, it's the, the value of sort of that attention to detail and the little things in life that really can have a more profound effect on the bigger things uh, that confront you. And so that's the sort of lead in to today's conversation and the value of a mediation brief and, and effectively writing one, because it is the attention to detail in that exercise that has the opportunity literally to shape the outcome of the mediation itself. Um, this really became a topic of interest for me earlier this year when um, the Weinstein International Foundation, uh, a group of which uh, uh, includes uh, senior fellows from uh, 75 countries around the world, some of you may be participating this morning, but as you then know, there was a uh, mediation brief writing competition, and the goal was to uh, inspire and develop effective mediation writing talents in law students around the world, <clears throat> and as that competition sort of took shape um, and amongst board members as we were trying to develop criteria for effectively judging those mediation briefs, what quickly became clear was there was very little that had been written about what went into making an effective mediation brief. For many of us in the mediation world, the sort of standard was, you know, I know a good brief when I see one kind of standard. 
uh, which in the first instance is uh, um, maybe uh, a little helpful, uh, but uh, particularly in the context of trying to judge briefs, uh, really provided little guidance and direction. And so it was only by thinking more uh, deeply about what goes into a, a mediation brief and particularly making an effective one that gave rise to first a blog and ultimately sort of this conversation. And what I want to do in the time that uh, we have uh, devoted today is really drill down on about a dozen attributes of uh, effective mediation brief writing and uh, address them uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of a mediator's perspective. And of course, ultimately allowing some time at the end to address any questions that you may find um, uh, helpful to your understanding of this important topic. So let's, let's begin. The um, first uh, attribute of an effective mediation brief is really a sort of a broader consideration. And the question is to share or not to share the mediation brief with the other side. And before I sort of address that more specifically and definitively, again, I want to remind all of you that it's important to uh, understand the why question about uh, we, why we do things, because once people understand the why we're doing things, then I think the how to and the answer to that question that follows will be much more meaningful. So yes, uh, in this sort of quintessential question of does one share the mediation brief with the other side? You know, it typically gets a short shrift in a mediation training or a mediation advocacy training when people say, yes, whenever possible, share the mediation brief with the other side. But let's don't stop there. Let's think about that more deeply for a moment. Imagine an example of a startup business in Silicon Valley with a group of young energetic entrepreneurs and they've been working hard for several years to develop a product. And over time, there's a dissatisfaction on the part of one of the engineers who then leaves the company, taking with him certain information that ultimately sort of finds its way into a competitor's product. And now you have a lawsuit for um, intellectual property theft, a breach of contract, the employment agreement, a host of other considerations. And in that environment, uh, in coming toward mediation and the opportunity to present a mediation brief, there's sort of one of two things that can happen. One is uh, you choose to either not write a brief at all, which unfortunately is all too common, or in some instances you present a mediation brief the night before, or I've even seen them delivered on the day of mediation, only after I, as the mediator, have suggested the value of presenting a mediation brief to the other side. And one side will say to me, well, there's not really much in there that's confidential. Go ahead and take it down the hall, or I'll give it to them when we come into a joint session in a few minutes. And so in that environment, or, uh, you have a board of directors who's come to the mediation, and they're sitting in a joint session for the first time, maybe in several years, looking across the table at that employee who they think is an outright thief or worse, having taken uh, company trade secrets to a competitor. And they're in that environment. They're uncomfortable. They're not used to mediation. They're out of their element. Uh, they're distracted by looking at this person. Uh, they're partially listening to counsel on the other side. Maybe they've got this mediation brief in front of them for the first time that they're reading through. <coughs> Contrast that opportunity to listen to the other side's messaging uh, with this scenario. Instead of that, let's say a week earlier, a counsel uh, for the employee uh, had presented a mediation statement to the company counsel and asked that it be distributed to uh, all of the decision makers. And so a week before people assemble for the mediation, the board of directors uh, individually are sitting at quietly in their home office at their desk, reading through this well-written uh, mediation brief, uh, pausing to reflect at times on information that may be new to them uh, in the first instance, maybe calling each other on the phone saying, did you read this? What do you make of this? All of a sudden, really having more of an opportunity to quietly reflect on that information in a completely different environment than the one I first described. <clears throat> so, that to me is if the why behind the 
uh, question, do we share or not share a mediation brief is, let's understand the reason for sharing is to persuade the other side of facts, if not an ultimate narrative, that's different than the one they brought into the room, then that process begins with an effective mediation brief and the opportunity that it presents for laying that at the doorstep of decision makers with a real opportunity to read and be persuaded. And when you understand that why question, then it becomes, I think, much more clear as to why both this topic is important and the opportunity to share a brief in particular is critical. Now, around this topic, we always get the conversation of, yes, Bruce, I get it, but you know, what if there's information that I want to share with you, you know, confidentially? Great. That's a typical part of the conversation, to be sure. And there's different ways to sort of manage that need, um, whether it's allowing uh, counsel to have a private conversation with you uh, in advance of the mediation, where they're given the opportunity to relay confidential information, or it's simply to suggest to both sides, you can share a mediation brief with each other that hopefully includes as much information as possible, or you can write a separate, or, or should say and, you can write a separate uh, confidential statement of a shorter nature, but just including those issues or topics that you don't want to reveal at least preliminarily to the other side. And so a combination or a hybrid of that approach will often give people uh, the best opportunity to both persuade others of the narrative uh, at the same time uh, developing confidential uh, communication with the mediator. So um, uh, all of that is uh, sort of against the backdrop of the mediator's perspective, which is when I come into a mediation room, um, ultimately the more information that I have in the public domain that I can work with, the better capable I am to advance your thoughts and arguments and positions and help you achieve your desired outcome. So having a well-written uh, mediation brief uh, starts by putting that information in the public domain, uh, having a joint session where information is shared publicly. All of that allows me to then hit the ground running when I move into private discussions with people. In contrast to people holding information close to the vest, not having any kind of public exchange of a mediation brief or otherwise sharing information. At that point, I'm particularly limited in terms of what I can do out of the starting gate to advance people's positions. All right, uh, number two, um, avoid using the repurposed legal document in lieu of a effective mediation brief. And all too often those attorneys who don't appreciate what opportunity exists in a mediation brief or otherwise is you know, out of time or otherwise hurried to present something to the mediator at the last minute, they'll opt for submitting uh, a, a legal document. And I can't tell you how many times, for example, I will get a, a complaint uh, attached uh, to a one page mediation statement and see our operative complaint. Well, what good is it for me to read through uh, three paragraphs of diversity jurisdiction written in a complaint uh, to further my understanding of the mediation uh, effort of, that's to follow? None at all is the precise answer. Or for example, if uh, somebody sends me a, as it happened most recently in a case, a 35 page well-written motion for summary judgment on a legal topic like the sudden emergency defense in a, a sort of a wrongful death case involving a, a collision between a big rig and a, a passenger vehicle. <clears throat> helpful, very helpful in terms of understanding the legal issue that was at the center of the case. But again, as we know from other conversations, legal issues are only a portion of those a criteria that decision makers rely on in making decisions about ultimate settlement. So focusing exclusively on the legal argument to the detriment of providing the mediator with other helpful information is again a missed opportunity in terms of developing the full panoply of, of facts and circumstances surrounding an ultimate decision that will need to be made. Um, I think that uh, the, the, let's talk about the third uh, element of an effective uh, mediation brief. And it has to do with summarizing facts 
efficiently and effectively. Um, here lies a difficult message for most mediation advocates to come to terms with. And this, the, 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 the statement is, for most mediators, the amount of detail, the amount of information, the amount of salient facts that are essential for a mediator to operate effectively in the mediation room is but a fraction of the kind of facts and, and detail that you would provide a trier of fact, whether it's an arbitrator or a judge or a jury. Let me say that again. The amount of factual information that's required for a mediator to work effectively in mediation is but a fraction of the information and detail that's required for you to present your case to a judge, jury, or arbitrator. And if you start with that appreciation, then hopefully and ideally, when you recite the facts in a mediation brief, you'll focus on those that are essential for a mediator's uh, efforts but don't overwhelm the mediator in terms of a flood of information. <clears throat> Yet I say that, but many a night I'm reading a 30 or 35 page brief, politely sifting through information that is superfluous uh, at best, overwhelming uh, at worst, <clears throat> and uh, reading things that have no place in a mediation statement, uh, mediation brief. I'm gonna read a paragraph and again, I, I do this with some trepidation because it's possible the lawyer who wrote this could even be uh, uh, listening. And certainly I'm not gonna identify anybody or even the case, but I'm gonna read it to illustrate a point. And so for example, in a case involving an insurance dispute uh, and under a, a factual summary section, here's a paragraph. This means among other things, that not only are men free to make contracts, they must for the sake of stability of the society for which they draw the benefits of their freedom, have the integrity to honor their agreements. They must not just recognize, but they must also live the maximum. He who takes the benefit must bear the burden. Nowhere does this premise of our freedom have a greater implication than in a request that a man labor for the benefit of another. There is absolutely nothing lower in a free society than to induce a man to work, take the benefits of his work and then fail to pay him, to spit in his face and on everything decent. This utterly contemptible behavior, if tolerated, will cause and is causing the country to fail. It goes on. Look, I'm all for creative writing, but there's a time and place for that type of writing. And a mediation brief is not that time or place. I'm looking for a concise, effective recitation of those facts that are going to help me navigate the circumstances I'm about to confront. I'm not looking for a Mishner novel or a creative writing piece. <clears throat> Keep that in mind as you think about uh, writing the, the summary of facts. Um, the fourth um, uh, point to emphasize with regard to uh, mediation brief writing uh, effectively is to cite case law appropriately and effectively. Here too, lawyers tend to err uh, on the side of being lawyers. What do I mean by that? Well, I can assure you that after 40 years in this profession of law, 35 or more of which have been involved in mediation, I don't need people to uh, lay out for me the uh, uh, basic uh, elements of a cause of action for negligence or I don't need the sort of predicate acts of a breach of contract claim. <clears throat> and if you're sort of seemingly doing that for my benefit, save the pen strokes, the key strokes. What I do need is a focus on those specific statutes or that one or two uh, seminal cases that bear on the determination of the legal issue central in the case. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> along the way, we'll get to this in a few minutes, sort of if there is not that type of definitive uh, uh, case law within your state, well, we can talk about that too. But my point in all of this is <clears throat> key legal arguments and the appropriate focus and attention on legal arguments in the case are often diluted by the sheer volume of recitation of case law and elemental uh, case law um, uh, by young lawyers who uh, feel that that's for some reason is necessary to my education. 
I assure you more often than not, it's not necessary to my education. And the sharper the focus in the brief, <clears throat> the more likely it is that I'm gonna both attend to and remember those key elements of your claim, of your narrative that need to be addressed both in my conversations with you and in my efforts to assist changing the narrative down the hall. <clears throat> so keep that in mind as you think uh, to answer the question, why is it that <clears throat> mediators only need uh, you know, a fraction of both the facts and the case law that might otherwise uh, uh, be worthy of discussion. Number five, um, set the proper tone. This is probably central to today's conversation because herein lies the true art of mediation advocacy, how one attempts to thread the needle between forceful advocacy while at the same time setting a tone of conciliation lies at the heart of effective mediation brief writing. It's um, <clears throat> um, apparent that mediation briefs are written for different audiences. I get that. If you're writing a brief, you've got a client or clients, you've got uh, lawyers on the other side, you've got the lawyer's clients, your adversaries on the other side as well. How you weave the, the thread and dance between those competing needs and objectives is really the art of the advocacy moment in writing your brief. <clears throat> um, you need to um, sort of prepare your client for the audience that you are preparing that brief uh, uh, for. <clears throat> you need people to appreciate and understand the balance of we have a uh, iron fist, but it's in a velvet glove and how the, the language that's contained in the mediation brief conveys both sentiments simultaneously is again, effective brief writing at its core. <clears throat> so think about that. Uh, take the time to not just write it in the first instance, but then step back and read what you've written from the standpoint of how will I respond to this if I'm the lawyer on the other side? How will I respond to this if I'm the client on the other side? Is there a sufficient tone of conciliation that people will come to the mediation with at least an open mind? Or am I sort of driving them further into their foxhole because I'm expressing the message that I'm somehow going to crush them in mediation? And I'm reminded of a conversation I had with one of my uh, colleagues um, uh, in this business, a, a skilled mediation advocate and mediator, uh, who I was interviewing for one of our uh, programs, who talked to me about his early experience as a mediation advocate coming into mediation with a mindset of sort of crushing his adversary and how quickly he realized that that was counterproductive. We'll take a step back from that opening session to writing the mediation brief and the same mindset should prevail. Meaning if I were to write a mediation brief that is monotonal in terms of crushing my adversary, Contemplate how my adversary is gonna respond. And is that gonna further our effort and opportunity for collaborative problem solving when we ultimately get to that point in the discussion, assuming we do. So <clears throat> seek to uh, set the proper tone in your mediation brief and appreciate, this is important, appreciate that the tone you set in that mediation brief will hopefully carry over into the opening and into the mediation itself. If you can establish the right balance between advocacy and collaboration, and you continue that messaging and tone when you get into the opening session, you'll be a giant step forward in terms of working with the mediator and the other side effectively in trying to uh, advance your client's positions. Related to that is point number six, which is look to persuade, not to put off. What do I mean by that? Look, as lawyers, we all tend to engage at times in overstatement, in exaggeration, even hyperbole. I just read you an example of something I would characterize as that. And here the challenge again is to convince others with the, about the strength of your position without sort of shutting them down. And a similar exercise, of course, will occur uh, in the opening session. But we're now talking about the mediation brief itself. And again, think back to my mental imagery of the um, clients in the sort of wrongful termination, misappropriation of trade secret example I gave a few minutes ago. And you're now the board members for the uh, company 
uh, that had filed the litigation. Uh, you're the lawyer for that company. You're now reading the other side's brief. And in the best example, that brief is um, relaying a narrative and facts that perhaps you're hearing for the first time. It's giving you the opportunity to pause and reflect, not necessarily immediately thinking about how you're going to respond. <clears throat> and because you've set the right tone and your, uh, your approach is to persuade, not to put off, the kinds of words that are used in that mediation brief are words that invite reflection. They're not the kinds of words that uh, are, are designed to put off. And uh, I, I once uh, sort of made a list of some of these. I couldn't put my hands on it uh, last night, kind of preparing for today's conversation. But if you see a sentence that begins with the words, even a first year associate can appreciate and it continues, I can almost guarantee you that the rest of that sentence, if it's read at all, is not going to be persuasive. persuasive. And there are similar kinds of, of sort of off-putting words and uh, hyperbole, uh, things that uh, uh, sort of cause the other side to move away from uh, active listening and an open-minded dialogue that I think we're all too familiar with as lawyers. So be cautious about the need uh, and, and timing of using those sorts of phrases uh, and hyperbole. Um, be, uh, we'll get to this in a minute, but, but um, be realistic about um, what information is available and, and avoid the conclusory and exaggerated language that says in every instance or everything we've learned. Acknowledge those weaknesses in deductive reasoning. Acknowledge those limitations in facts in the case. And by so doing, you're going to only further your credibility with the mediator in the process, if not the other side in your presentation to them in this written document. So be thoughtful about how you're attempting to persuade and avoid those uh, lawyer-like opportunities that we sometimes avail ourselves of that become off-putting in the presentation. Number seven, let's talk about um, imagining and addressing what the other side needs to claim success on their way to settlement. Here again, I'm reminded of an example. Uh, years ago, when I was in Scotland with the International Academy of Mediators and part of our panel um, discussions over those couple of days was a presentation by Bill Urey. Everybody should know Bill Urey, author of Getting to Yes and many other uh, books from the uh, Harvard Negotiation Project. But Bill was giving a talk uh, one day about uh, his efforts to negotiate a truce, literally a peace agreement, between the government of Colombia and the uh, insurgent rebels known as FARC uh, that had been going on for, I think, almost 50 years. And in one of his first meetings with the government, as they were strategizing about how to come into this mediation moment, Bill had the government thinking, what is it that the um, leaders of this uh, group will need to take back to their constituents, ultimately, to convince them to be uh, successful uh, in gaining agreement and are allowing them to be successful in gaining agreement on an ultimate settlement. <clears throat> and to that extent, Bill described it as sort of helping build a golden bridge back to that decision moment. And that imagery, that conversation, never is too early to begin. And specifically in writing an effective mediation brief, one should be thinking about what is it that the other side is going to need in this conversation? What is the other side going to be able to take back to their constituents? And when they do go back to their constituents with this messaging, what's the reception likely to be? And so that begins, as I've said already, both in terms of the tone and the comment uh, content of the uh, mediation brief itself. So when one is writing the mediation brief, be thinking about that ultimate audience, be thinking about objectives that they're going to have. And I appreciate, and we'll talk in a few more minutes substantively about how one does this, but it's never too early to initiate that conversation. It's never too early to envision that the best negotiators not only um, advance and ultimately succeed in claiming value for their clients, but they also figure out ways to create value for people sitting across the table. 
recognizing that that's essential if an ultimate agreement is to be achieved. So again, from a mediation uh, brief writing exercise, start by thinking about that, start by addressing your brief in a way that at least opens the door to the potential for solutions that will be successfully received by those across the table. Think about building a golden bridge. Number eight, <clears throat> don't overlook mediation history uh, in writing your brief. Here again, let me offer you an example. Some of you have heard this story before, but it certainly is memorable to me, and that's why I like uh, stories in general and specifically this one. But I was in a mediation in a construction matter in Las Vegas one year, and I had asked the homeowner group representing the, uh, the homeowners and their counsel uh, after an initial opening session to be patient over the course of the day while I spent time uh, really trying to raise money for their benefit and ultimately to settle the case. And in the hours that ensued, filling the vast majority of the day, I probably engaged in 15 or 20 separate negotiations with subcontractors and general contractors and design professionals and others involved in the litigation. And toward the end of the day, as the sun was setting, I went into the room of defendants and I said, okay, collectively I've, we've raised a million dollars. I don't hold any hope that this is gonna be the final answer, but it certainly is a very good faith um, step uh, to take with this uh, board and to claim value from the last eight hours of work. And so I, with their blessing, I went down the hall, I went into the private meeting with the Homeowners Association board and their council and doing my normal, normal sort of mediators uh, <clears throat> dance, I said, look, I appreciate this isn't necessarily the end of the discussion, but what I'm about to tell you, I think is a, is a very good faith first step. But I've been able successfully through a host of conversations to raise a million dollars and I'm now uh, authorized to put that in play. And you looked around the room and it was like I had just told people that, that, they, that there'd been a death in the family. I mean, it was quiet. It was people looking down at the table. Finally, the plaintiff's lawyer looked at me and said, Bruce, I, I don't wanna throw cold water on your good efforts today, but I've got to say, we're very disappointed. I, I kind of furrowed my brow. I said, why is that, Bob? Because frankly, it seemed to me like this was uh, a, a valiant exercise. He said, well, it has nothing to do with your hard work or effort. It's just that I'd received a phone call from the person who's down the hall. His boss had called me about a week ago, hoping we could avoid the expense of this process. He offered me a million and a half dollars. Okay. I said, give me a minute. So I walked down the hall and I put my head back in the room and I said, look, um, I just need to let you all know that I just offered a million dollars down the hall and it went over about as poorly as one could uh, you know, imagine. Anybody want to tell me, was there something you forgot to say when I was here last? And I was looking particularly at this insurance adjuster who was then kind of looking down at his lap somewhat sheepishly and he looked up, he said, oh, this was that case. I said, well, maybe it is, what are you thinking? He said, yeah, uh, my boss um, uh, at one point mentioned that one of my files, he had previously uh, said to plaintiff's counsel, if we could avoid mediation, he'd be willing to pay a million and a half dollars. I said, well, that would have been good to know, uh, certainly at the outset of today, it would have been even better to know before I sort of walked down the hall and offered something less to the plaintiff's group. <laughs> and that began a hard, left turn in our negotiations that required me to do a whole lot of uh, uh, sort of bridge building, uh, looking backwards as we try to get that negotiation back on a productive path. My point in that story is simple. It is what happens prior to people coming into the mediation process is central to the conversation, including where you're gonna start in any negotiation. And so, um, uh, don't overlook the importance, if not in the mediation brief, but I, I say it in the context of this discussion because it's never too early to educate the mediator, um, at least with regard to formal positions. If there have been offers of judgment under statutes in your state, certainly that would be public, uh, uh, almost public knowledge in the case. So by all means, put that in the brief. But don't overlook whether the information is conveyed in the mediation brief that is um, exchanged publicly or in the confidential submission, if you choose to go that route as well, 
don't overlook the opportunity of discussing those nuanced conversations that lawyers often have that at least cast shadows around the direction of the negotiation. What do I mean by that? Look, not uncommon, lawyers walking out of a long day of a deposition, they're in the parking lot and one lawyer says to the other, you know, look, Jane, uh, you know, this is silly. We just wasted a whole day getting information from somebody we knew in advance what they were gonna say. If your client can just get us a demand that's in six figures, you know, I think maybe we can get this thing put to bed, right? And they, the other lawyer promises to take that comment back to the client, nothing happens. You get to mediation and what, guess what happens? One side says, well, the other side said they would settle this, you know, for $750,000 or high six figures, or they've got some memory of the uh, exchange uh, that may or may not be factually accurate. The point is simply that discussion happened. It created impressions and it created expectations potentially that the mediator needs to know in fashioning the negotiation process. So in the mediation brief, both formal and informal exchanges are going to be critical to the mediator being able to help you navigate the road ahead and get that information to him or her as soon as you possibly can, uh, hopefully starting with the mediation brief itself. Point number eight in addressing um, the uh, mediation brief writing is uh, has to do with um, addressing obstacles to settlement. Look, again, the why question is important. Why would you ever sort of address obstacles to settlement? Well, certainly some of them may be apparent to both sides and they're easily enough addressed in the mediation uh, brief so as not to show a sign of weakness, for example. It may be something like, gee, we're in a COVID environment and the courts these days can't get uh, trials to uh, commence uh, for the next two or three years, given the backlog of cases, the complexity of sort of navigating jury trials. We can all agree on that. So let's focus on settlement because that's an obstacle going forward. Or maybe there's a missing witness or piece of information that people have yet to find. <clears throat> um, the why behind this is as a mediation advocate, you want to begin to develop trust and respect with the mediator in your messaging. It, it uh, occurs in all sorts of different ways. As I said already, uh, hyperbole in your mediation brief is a negative. It detracts from your ability to build credibility with the mediator, overgeneralizing, uh, hypothesizing, things like that have their place, but overly done, they really uh, <clears throat> detract from your opportunity to develop trust and credibility with the mediator. Conversely, your opportunity to be uh, honest and forthcoming in those deficiencies and potential shortcomings in your case, in your argument, are things that will advance your credibility with the mediator. So don't overlook the opportunity um, to, to provide that information. And again, this could be an, an opportunity in a confidential submission as opposed to the mediation brief that's exchanged with the other side. That's perfectly understandable for all the obvious reasons, but for whatever, in whatever fashion you choose to do it, get that information out there. And I think uh, it sort of segues to the next point, uh, item number 10, which is uh, sort of acknowledging weaknesses within your case. I don't know if it's a local court rule in Las Vegas, but <clears throat> there are uh, a number of firms that I work with there that in their Pre, uh, in their mediation briefs, their pre-mediation submissions, they um, have a section on the uh, sort of weaknesses of their case. So for example, even in a case that um, uh, sort of cries out for settlement, uh, it certainly has significant liability risks and concerns. I'm, I'm thinking of an example where a college fraternity student went to a uh, one of the uh, hotels in Las Vegas was engaged in some partying activity and he dove into a swimming pool that God unfortunately was only four feet deep and he broke his neck and was a paraplegic. I think he was more closer to a quadriplegic than a paraplegic and yet in, in this plaintiff's brief after sort of acknowledging all the strengths of their cases which had to do with the injury and life-changing events themselves they had to acknowledge that at least there was a blood alcohol content their client had, not past the legal limit, but 
uh, certainly uh, he'd been drinking, and at some point ran past a sign uh, that uh, suggested that there was uh, <clears throat> sort of diving at your own risk uh, because the pool was in varying depths. And so they had to sort of acknowledge those deficiencies or potential weaknesses in their liability claim along their way toward advancing their strongest arguments. And in so doing, I think they really came across to me as knowing what they were doing and really um, uh, sort of creating the kind of, of trust and, and respect that allowed me to continue working with them throughout the day in a very candid, straightforward fashion. And contrast that with those moments in mediation where I would first learn those kinds of things from the other side, because undoubtedly I would, and then I have to come back into a private session, or maybe I hear it for the first time in a joint session, and I'm wondering to myself, why didn't I read in the plaintiff's brief that their client had a blood alcohol level? It seems like that would be something important for me to have heard, and better to have heard it in the first instance um, you know, from the plaintiffs as a potential deficiency in their case, as opposed to hearing it from the defendants as a potential defense. It's not unlike a skilled trial lawyer will introduce potentially negative evidence in a way of sort of softening the landing for a jury or judge when they're about to hear that, you know, in the evidence as presented by the defendant. It's a way of sort of uh, taking the wind out of the sails of that argument, if you will. And so in your mediation brief, look for opportunities to acknowledge those uh, types of weaknesses. Uh, point number 11, um, propose uh, workable, creative solutions. <clears throat> um, again, there may be a contrast between those that you're willing to put forward in your public exchange mediation statement versus those you're prepared to provide the mediator in a confidential submission. I get that. <clears throat> but either way, look for those opportunities to <clears throat> advance the ball uh, in the mediation process by playing to the strength of the mediation process itself. Look, as we all know, <clears throat> mediation, one of its many attributes is that uh, <clears throat> it's really sort of only limitation is one's imagination and creativity in finding solutions that match up to the needs of the parties in dispute. <clears throat> and yet mediation briefs oftentimes are walled in by the four corners of legal argumentation and the kinds of potential remedies that are suggested in those mediation briefs are similarly walled in uh, by based on legal remedies. And only those potential outcomes that are available under the law are those that are considered and discussed and advanced in a mediation brief. And therein, again, misses an opportunity. <clears throat> um, in mediation, as we know, uh, this, this concept of creativity, this idea of thinking outside the box is one of the things that really makes this process so unique and so successful. Why not start that process in the mediation brief itself by addressing some of those things that might lie outside the uh, realm of contemplation, at least within the eyes of legal remedies. I'll give you an example here. Years ago, uh, there was a wrongful death case involving um, highway uh, uh, highway work on a local freeway that was taking place overnight and somebody coming back from a late shift um, there was a question of whether there was adequate safety warnings as this person came up on roadway construction in the middle of the night with limited warning and crashed his car into a uh, construction vehicle and was killed and in the mediation brief uh, I read with interest that the um, defendant said, my client is traveling to the mediation from Arizona, wants to participate in a joint session, wants the opportunity to apologize to this man's widow and children face to face. Uh, irrespective of the rest of the day's efforts and the outcome of the case, he'll be there in an effort to work in good faith. But first and foremost, this is something that is important to him as an individual and to his company's culture. And that was obviously an exercise in both setting an appropriate tone, one of potential conciliation, but it also then went on to sort of speak about some different creative ideas as well that I think matched up to the needs uh, ultimately of the family and allowed the case to settle. So this, this concept of trying to work creatively, <clears throat> uh, be flexible you know, in these discussions and start in the mediation brief at the earliest opportunity proposing an open mind to creative solutions 
is a um, significant step forward in both setting the tone and addressing uh, the possibility of, of creative solutions. Um, a 12th point is uh, one that has to do with sort of the mediation brief itself being well-written and timely. I'll address those in turn. The well-written part kind of should speak for itself. You know, anytime you're submitting something to a court, uh, a lot of effort goes into um, uh, making sure that the document itself is grammatically correct, uh, that punctuation is correct, uh, all the things that just generally go into a good uh, exercise in writing. And I suspect in most firms, there's a process in place where um, people uh, help each other wordsmith and correct uh, written documents that go to the court. Yet in mediation, I, I so often doubt that uh, that exercise has taken place in many instances, because what's submitted to me in the guise of an effective, well-written mediation brief often contains uh, grammatical errors, um, repetitive phrases, things that could have, should have been addressed through just a very careful uh, <clears throat> a review of a document before it was submitted. And if it's, you know, as we say in the world, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And that's true both in terms of the impression this brief is now gonna make with the mediator, as well as with the other side. If you've got a well-written brief that is <clears throat> making an impression in the right tone, the right content, the right focus, <clears throat> um, it's gonna start by persuading the other side that there's a competent, forceful advocate on the other side, yet one who's there with an open mind to addressing settlement. Conversely, if you've thrown together something at the last minute that's full of errors and deficiencies, it's, uh, uh, it's gonna be something that is uh, uh, not well received on the other side. And it's gonna create an impression that um, you know, across the table or down the hall, there's somebody that is less than you know, well prepared. So um, think about that as you write your brief, think about it from the standpoint of, would I be comfortable submitting this to a judge for consideration? And if not, why not? Uh, am I prepared to uh, submit something of lesser quality in, on a day that is potentially as important as if I were in front of a judge or jury? So um, quality. Timing is another uh, aspect of, um, of effective brief writing and submission. And the idea there, of course, is that you get um, um, briefs oftentimes submitted um, in, in, instead of a week or 10 days in advance, which is what I usually request, briefs come in any hour of the day or night prior to the morning of mediation. I can't tell you how many times that I've been told by people, uh, gee, did you get my mediation brief this morning? It was like, well, the good news is I get to my desk at 6.30. So the answer hopefully is yes. Hopefully I've had a chance to read through it, but I guarantee you it probably didn't get the same type of critical evaluation and certainly didn't get the rereading that I try and do with every brief had it been submitted you know, a week in advance. And if that's true for me as the mediator, well, you've missed your opportunity to persuade the other side uh, because of that late submission as well. That mental image I presented uh, you know, 45 minutes ago of somebody saying, um, uh, sitting at their home office desk, quietly reflecting on a mediation statement, you miss that chance completely. Now, if the mediator is just getting it that morning, I can almost assure you that decision makers on the other side are probably in transit to the mediation or otherwise uh, involved in other things. They're certainly not watching their uh, inbox for a late arriving mediation statement. So if you're gonna avail yourself of the benefits that we've just been talking about over the last 45 minutes or so, do so in a way that gives people a chance to, and you a chance to maximize those benefits. Get the mediation brief to people in advance. It's just a question of timing. It's just a question of being prepared. <clears throat> and so um, uh, pay attention to those details. It's really uh, the opportunity to attend to details in mediation brief writing that really is so overlooked in this profession. And it really, as I said you know, a while ago, it really came to light when we were uh, doing this Weinstein International Foundation program and thereafter, 
uh, when we were attempting to determine what was out there that could provide cogent, thoughtful uh, advice to mediation advocates on how to write an effective mediation brief. And the complete dearth of <clears throat> information that was available, I think, um, really drove me to give more thought to this conversation and to really think through and spell out a lot of the sort of detail and, and advice that uh, I've been presenting this morning. What I'd like to do now, I think, is um, pause and uh, invite people to ask questions, uh, Kirsten, because I think it's uh, uh, sort of helpful for people to have an opportunity to explore this in whatever detail they will find helpful. Absolutely, we have a few good questions in here. Um, the first one from Mohan, a mediator at the main mediation center of Bombay High Court. Question is, if the mediation brief indicates willingness to amicably settle the disputes through mediation, it sets the right tone for mediation. This is my personal experience, especially in commercial disputes, where the parties know that litigation is going to be very costly and time consuming for all of them. What is your reflection on this issue? Wow. Well, thank you for the good question and good evening to you, sir. The, um, uh, my, my impression and my uh, reaction to this is, I think it reflects a deeper level of appreciation for the mediation opportunity. If someone is prepared to write a mediation brief that sets that right tone of potential conciliation and an open-mindedness to be flexible and creative in searching for a solution, I think you're, you're uh, well out of the starting blocks in the race and down the track, at, in, in contrast to a lot of the things that I more traditionally see in this practice. So congratulations on uh, um, sort of that experience. And I certainly hope it's one that uh, help takes, helps take root in the community in Bombay and beyond. All right, next question is, I think it's probably a quick one. Iman asked if, could I get a, a model of a mediation brief? <laughs> uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I'll have to give a little thought to that because obviously one of the challenges of course is confidentiality. And so we're always trying to walk the tightrope between sharing things that are well done in mediation and protecting the confidentiality of those who would otherwise uh, uh, not wish for their uh, efforts to be made uh, more public. So let me think about that a little bit and see if there is, in fact, something that I have or something that a party might be willing to allow me to share. Um, thank you for that invitation and we'll try and follow up. All right, next question we have. Bruce, this may be more than you can discuss here today, but I'm still having a really hard time losing my litigator mode. I try, and the truth is, in the quiet of my office, I can write a brief that works, but when I get in that room and the conversation starts, I can't help but go back into the litigator. What do you suggest? Uh, well, we have an operation for that. No, I'm kidding. The, um, obviously, we're all creatures of our historical training and experience, and the first step is self-awareness, so congratulations on your self-awareness. Um, perhaps easier uh, to control in the brief writing moment because you can write your first brief as adversarial as you choose, sit on it for a few days, come back and rewrite it, and then rewrite it again with these lessons and thoughts in mind about how to thread the needle as I've described it between being that forceful advocate and ultimately striking a tone of conciliation. Bounce it off other people and not just other people in your law firm, but maybe your spouse, significant other, somebody else and say, how would you respond to this if you read it? What, what comes to mind? And just get reactions from people and help retrain yourself in uh, sort of uh, uh, having the pendulum swing back a bit closer to the middle. In you know, the, the opening session itself, you're right, it is probably a longer discussion than we have time for today, but I've seen different ways that play out. I've seen people bring team of lawyers into a room and using, you know, relying on those to present the statement who maybe come across in a softer, more conciliatory way and sort of having a good cop, bad cop role in the negotiation, you know, if one is sort of incapable of uh, uh, adopting both personas, you know, those would be thoughts that come to mind. But again, um, it is uh, uh, critical to start with a self-reflection. And if you find yourself in the room, you know, with that uh, sort of taking on that persona and one that might legitimately jeopardize uh, the, your potential for an effective solution, 
you know, you might talk to the mediator about that and just say, you know, feel free to cut me off if you think, you know, I'm headed down the wrong path in my advocacy in the moment. And I'm going to do my best to sort of strike the right balance. But, um, you know, here's what my own concerns are. And you can have that discussion with the mediator and uh, he or she can kind of help you um, uh, come across in a way that's most uh, beneficial for your client. All right, next question. Bruce, I'm one of those lawyers that you joke with about the length of my submissions. But as you know, my cases are complicated. I can't leave anything out. What can I do? How can I get a mediator up to speed on a highly complicated case in only 10 pages? If the information needed is truly only a fraction of litigation brief, how do I know what may come up and what do you need to know? By the way, I am not the one that wrote that brief that you read. <laughs> I appreciate the question. Um, Look, there are those cases that would that do require um, additional information to a mediator that isn't um, doesn't lend itself to a ten-page brief. I get that, and there may be other things that can be submitted, you know, as exhibits or in addition to the mediation brief itself that allow the mediator to gain additional insight or information as a backdrop to the coming mediation. And so that may be something that's worthy of conversation either in a group uh, discussion pre-mediation or in private conversations with the mediator. Bruce, what do you want? How much do you need to know? These are the things that I'm prepared to you know, share with you. I certainly want to present things in a way that help you, help my client understand that uh, I have a firm grasp of this uh, case factually and otherwise, and the other side the same. So what's the right balance? So have a discussion about this on your checklist of convening activities to discuss with the mediator. And again, you know, it is a delicate balance uh, because lawyers tend to want to err on the side of, of, of over uh, exhaustion, of thoroughness, of, of completeness, of presenting and information and leaving it to the mediator to sift through what's essential from what's uh, less than essential in the process. Um, again, a good, clear conversation with a mediator is a good way to not only uh, sort of address that question substantively, but to sort of set the right tone of trust and respect for kind of the process and what you're trying to accomplish. So roll up your sleeves, work with a mediator, you know, find out what he or she thinks is, is helpful and effective. And look, as mediators, if we're missing information, you know, we're all, we're pretty uh, uh, capable of trying to develop that on the fly ourselves and asking questions that might address issues and otherwise uh, get at information that maybe wasn't completely worked up in the moment of a mediation brief or otherwise. So uh, again, uh, sort of a general uh, answer uh, to a, a more specific problem. But I think if one starts by thinking more often than not, I can try and shift my um, uh, predilection to a shorter, more concise brief and I will go the other direction only in those unique circumstances that dictate, I think you're going to be a step ahead. All right, I think we have time for one more question here. When we say the brief should be as if it was to be addressed to a judge, et cetera, does that include a formal writing only, a strict type, or can it be somehow rounded so to create a, let's say, a positive attitude from our side to begin with? Good question. Again, I'm not a stickler on the formality of the presentation. I'm not looking for a mediation brief to appear in pleading form, and I'm certainly not a stickler that the language itself, even though I would hope to be grammatically correct, uh, doesn't have to be in the sort of legalese that uh, we as lawyers you know, often engage in. And again, this goes back to the who's the intended audience and what is the messaging that we're after in mediation, beginning with the brief. And if the answer to that question is, I really want this in plain English because those board members, those decision makers down the hall who are going to be reading this in advance of the mediation need to be, they need to be given pause to reflect on a narrative that's different than the one they're bringing into this uh, mediation room. <clears throat> and ultimately, they need to be persuaded. And the best way to do that, I found, is through plain English and things that are written in a manner that uh, promote reflection and understanding. So think about that in terms of how you're writing your mediation brief. Um, most of us from the mediation side are going to be welcome recipients of plain English 
that's written in a way that uh, allows us to both understand and help you communicate that message. All right, wonderful. I think that brings us to the end of the hour. Bruce, do you have any last words before I give a couple of closing comments here? No, I just, I, well, I guess I do in that, I, again, I appreciate <clears throat> people sort of paying attention to this because to sort of bring us full circle, it's the attention to detail of the smaller things that are important in so many aspects of our life and certainly in mediation advocacy as well. And the ability to slow down our thinking our, the ability to focus on a detailed uh, uh, portion of the mediation process, specifically writing briefs effectively, has, I think, long been ignored in the profession generally, and specifically as part of the mediation advocacy movement has been ignored as well. So I think the timing is good that people uh, start to really pay attention to how this can make such a profound difference in their opportunities to perfect their clients' interests when they get to the mediation table. All right, well, thank you, Bruce. This was a great topic. Um, thanks to everybody who joined and participated with us today. As a reminder, keep an eye on your inbox. We will send you an email to let you know when the recording of this webinar is available on our website. Um, and with that, we'll end today's webinar. Hope you have a great day or night, depending on where you're at. And we hope to see you back here soon. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everyone.